Uh, we've got a great panel, Terry. Hopefully we'll get some answers to your questions about hydrofracking. We've got a great panel here, and I'm going to be rather brief in my introductions. Uh, most of you know these panelists, uh, can go online and get some more background information about them. Uh, but I want to keep as much time as we can for the, uh, for the questions and as much time as we can for your questions to them. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to call my friend, uh, Representative Tryon Lewis uh, from uh, uh, House District uh, 81, I believe. Uh, he's Vice Chair of Judiciary and Civil Jurisprudence. He's on the Higher Ed Committee. Uh, he attended Odessa Junior College, Austin, uh, UT Austin and Baylor Law, State District Judge from 85 to 06, and has been a state representative since 2009. Um, our second panelist is um, Keith Strama. He's an attorney with Beatty, Bangle and Strama, a law firm in Austin. He represents a lot of clients from diverse industries, energy insurance, telecommunications. He works closely with state agencies, TABC, TCEQ, Railroad Commission. Uh, he's represented a lot of major oil companies in drafting and enacting legislation relating to royalty reporting and taxation of fuels in Texas. Uh, the third panelist is Leonard Dougal with Jackson Walker. Leonard. Uh, he is a partner with Jackson Walker, member of their environmental and legislative practice group. He has a JD with honors from UT Austin. He's co-authored two chapters in the Texas Water Law Treatise, The Essentials of Texas Water Resources, and many other bar and legal education seminar papers. Uh, the fourth panel is Jim Polinus, Polonis, I'm sorry, General Manager of Sutton County Underground Water District. He's got his bachelor's at uh, at, uh, in biology at St. Mary's with an MBA from Trinity University. He's ranched in Sutton County. Uh, currently he is the general manager of the Sutton County Underground Water District. John Ben Shepherd, there you are. Uh, he is uh, a president of the Permian Basin Petroleum Owners Association. He's been that, held that position to, since 2006. He served on many committees for House Energy Resources, uh, served in Chairman Hildebrand's Water Policy Advisor before the Natural Resources Committee in the 79th session. Uh, so we've got a great panel, and um, let's, get, let's get to the 900-pound gorilla in the room. I'm just going to throw out some questions. Now, what I'd like to do is simply uh, start the, the questioning off. You've all got... Uh, a great understanding about different parts of this puzzle and I'd like you to just jump in uh, when you can uh, answer a question that may not have been directed at you but uh, certainly uh, you have some expertise in and I would hope that we would have at least 10 minutes 15 minutes at the end that you might ask them some questions so with that uh, let's throw out this hydrofracking issue that that uh, Terry mentioned, uh, who, who on this panel can talk about the new techniques involved with hydrofracking and, and allay some of the concerns that, that uh, everyone here has out here in West Texas about uh, use of fresh water, certainly uh, the recovery of fresh water, and we'll talk about some conservation techniques also. So I'm just going to throw that out and, and somebody step up and let's start talking about it. Thank you, Chairman. I'll take a stab at it. Obviously. Uh, it is a uh, subject that's on everybody's mind, particularly here today, and I think uh, I'll just have to, to sort of reiterate some of the points that were made. I'm preaching to the choir in this crowd, but clearly uh, West Texas and uh, the Permian in particular are dependent on water, also oil and gas, the, the taxes, the employment, all the things we all know about, but it's, it's a concern. We've been in a, a period of extended drought since, I don't know, 1994 particularly the uh, last couple of years been particularly bad. Um, uh, people have a lot of questions about how much water are each, you know, we drive up and down the highway or you watch the news or read the papers, you see the, the extremely high uh, oil and gas activity right now. Uh, we're, we're in a very robust cycle. Half the rigs running in America are in Texas. Half of those are in the Permian Basin. Uh, most of those wells these days are fracked. Um, been a lot of uh, media coverage, uh, some erroneous about uh, 
the safety uh, of fracking. I really want to, well, maybe we'll get to that one later, but, uh, but uh, with respect to uh, water uses, it, 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 both fresh water for drilling and, and fracking, uh, oil and gas operators are, are keenly aware of, of uh, uh, the amount of water that's necessary to bring the oil and gas up out of the ground. They are, as has been mentioned already, they purchase that water. It's a cost. It's a major cost. And so, so there's uh, sort of, it's, it, it, in the past, it's been sort of a cost. Water has been sort of a cost and an afterthought, uh, sort of an interesting science experiment. What do we do with the water uh, uh, when we're through? In some cases, it was a nuisance. Uh, in the present, I, I think you're, you're seeing instances where individual, I mean, think there's university research being done, but also much, a great deal of it, uh, research is being done on how to use less water. The propane fracks, the gel fracks, are, they can reduce water uh, down to a quarter. In some cases, uh, uh, more than that, uh, their uh, cost is an issue. Uh, a as people get their arms around the technology, these, uh, you know, the larger companies uh, have the wherewithal to begin experimenting with that, and they've done so. Uh, I think you're going to see the technology uh, uh, being utilized more widespread uh, as the costs continue to come down. Uh, your water usage is going to come continue to come down. The other thing that's really going on, uh, there's a couple, <clears throat> but the primary one is recycling. Um, there's at least six. Uh, maybe seven registered uh, recyclers out there uh, by registered by the, uh, with the Railroad Commission. There's a newly formed uh, in the last year, uh, Texas Water Recycling Association. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of emphasis being put on uh, mobile uh, recycling facilities and even some uh, permanent uh, recycling out in the oil, oil field uh, with, the, with the goal to reduce, again, the amount of water being used. I don't have any hard numbers on on where we are with, with uh, re recycling. We're, we're actually going to have a panel this afternoon on uh, just some of these techniques and, and measures that are being used. I think just the final point there is oil and gas operators who I represent here, uh, uh, we recognize, and frankly, most people that operate out in the Permian Basin live in the Permian Basin. And so we recognize and are, and are working daily to try to reduce our water footprint. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you. You're an underground water district, so tell me your perspective about this hydrofracking process right. in the water. What I'd like to do is illustrate just how much water we have. During a fourth grade uh, water uh, fair that we have for the kids in Sonora, we have a demonstration of taking a five gallon tank of water. From that five gallon tank of water, we take out 12 and a half ounces of water. The five gallons represents all the water in the world. The 12 and a half ounces represents all the water in lakes, aquifers, glaciers, that everything that has to do with fresh water. Then we have them take four ounces of that, and that represents the amount of groundwater in the world. This is what we're dealing with. We have we're like three men in a tub. We have municipal, we have agriculture, and we have oil and gas. And we have to be able to balance all of those needs and desires in order to support our economy, keep this machine running, and try to do everything we can to allocate that scarce resource among those uses. Back in 2009, we did a uh, eight county study where we looked at the water budget for the counties that touched Sutton County. There are eight counties involved in this particular effort. What we found out was in order to recharge that aquifer, it takes a, an annual amount of 17 inches of rainfall before we get recharged. The last few years, we've been living on our bank account. We've been doing good, but we have to manage that resource in order to cover all these needs and include in that the population increase over the next 50 years. In uh, Sutton County, we're coming up with new rules for uh, spacing, for the 
amount of water that uh, can be taken out and still cover the needs in accordance with uh, how Senate Bill 332 and trying to keep things balanced. So we also have uh, built a uh, demonstration rain harvest project to show people that you can harvest the rain. We took half the roof at the Civic Center and we have uh, 12,000 gallons of storage that we can collect and uh, demonstrate that that is a viable method of saving water and using other resources. And then we built a uh, drought contingency well on the north end of our golf course. We're gonna use that as a trigger well for our drought contingency plan. We also monitor 31 wells across the county and we're gonna tie those, we have normalized those to sea level and we're going to use that information in order to tie it in with that drought contingency well and be able to better manage that uh, water resource. And this year, we're planning to do nitrate studies in our aquifer to better understand the transmissivity, any storage, and where our water is coming from and where it's going to. Uh, Leonard, uh, I know you have uh, expertise in this area and, and you know about how much water is being used. Could you explain the relationship between energy use and, and hydrofracking of freshwater and the groundwater districts? And do they have to make application for, uh, for these wells? And uh, how much water is being used from your perspective? Um, Representative, thanks for the, the chance to uh, speak to you all today. Um, as some of you all know, uh, I'm a practicing lawyer today, but years ago I was a petroleum engineer. Is this thing on? Can you all hear me OK? A little closer. Just, yeah. Before I became a Everyone lawyer, I was moved a, mic uh, just a little closer. Before I was a lawyer, I was a, a petroleum engineer, and um, it's interesting that we're having this uh, debate about fracking. There's a lot of uh, controversy, not necessarily in Texas, but frankly in a lot of uh, other states. But in some urban areas of Texas, there's controversy about fracking. But uh, many of you know we've been fracking wells in Texas for over 60 years. Uh, fracking was patented back in 1948. Um, and one thing we've seen is when the drilling moved out of the rural areas where the farmers and ranchers were getting a check and moved into the urban areas like Fort Worth, Texas, there got to be a lot more controversy about not necessarily the fracking technique, but the 18 wheelers on the road, the pipelines being put in people's front yards and issues like that. So. Um, you know, the, the start of the, of the story is fracking's not new. What's changed is we now are combining these multi-stage massive fracks with these long lateral horizontal wells, which have been a complete game changer in terms of uh, developing uh, new oil and gas reserves. I mean, if you look at some of the reserve numbers, Proven shale gas reserves going from 23 trillion cubic feet in 2007, four, ye four years later that number is four times as much. I mean, the, the uh, technology has just been an absolute game changer. Um, in terms of water use, um, we, need to look at, we need to look at lower quality sources of water for the oil and gas companies to use. But the reality is the oil and gas industry only uses, and Ben knows this number, one to two percent of the water used across the state of Texas is used by the oil industry. Now, certainly there are areas, there are arid areas of the state where five million gallons being used to frack a well is a lot of water, and we need to be careful. Uh, we need to find ways to, uh, again, use less water and certainly use lower quality water. Use treated effluent from the wastewater treatment plants, use more saline water that's not drinkable. Um, those are things that need to be looked at um, in terms of helping reduce the water footprint of, of the fracking. Um, uh, Keith, uh, you've been very instrumental in writing some legislation that we passed last year in the House about disclosure of chemicals within the hydrofracking process. Would you elaborate on that? <coughs> Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Representative Darby. And despite what you will hear from Washington and the EPA, it's, it's a surprise to many people to learn that Texas has the most progressive disclosure law in the country in regards to disclosing chemical ingredients in hydraulic fracturing fluids. How did Texas get to be to that point where Texas, which is generally seen as fairly conservative, has the most progressive disclosure law? 
and the the industry pushed that law because they see the need to break through the misconceptions created by the EPA and others about the impact that the fluids have on groundwater. Because to date, we, had, we don't know of a case in Texas where the, the fluids put into the drilling, in the drilling process have contaminated groundwater, despite what you might, what might have heard. So the industry strongly backed a very progressive disclosure bill because they thought that landowners deserve to know what, what are going down the wells. And without the disclosure, there's, there, you continue to have misconceptions about the process. The, the disclosure differed from other states because it, it's not limited to just those chemical ingredients that are de hazardous by the federal government, which are called the MSDS DS ingredients. They're all ingredients. They're publicly available on the Frac Focus website, which is a great resource for any landowner to learn about the hydraulic fracturing process. And, and again, the, re, the Texas, te, the, the, when you listen to people in Washington, they talk about the need for an energy revolution. And people in Texas misunderstand that because we know the revolution is here. We have, in the past 10 years, revolutionized, the, in, the been a leader in revolutionizing the energy industry, and now have a sustainable, clean source of domestic energy that is a real path to energy independence. The, the, the obstacles are misconceptions about the process, and what, what you have now with the disclosure bill is, is, a, is a real way for people to understand what is actually happening and that this isn't a dangerous process for the groundwater. The, the one thing in the bill that was, was tricky in terms of getting all stakeholders to agree to the bill was a, was a provision to allow those companies that manufacture the fluids to protect some trade secrets so that the hundreds of millions of dollars they put into something like the gel or the process are protected. We went to the, um, I will say, best legal mind in the house to, to help draft the, the trade secret provisions. Judge Lewis was the one who, who explained well, it on the floor. <laughs> and, um, and it was a big part of drafting that. And it, and, it, it, and it has become a model bill throughout the country and is now being adopted by, by other states. And, and we're really proud of that. Well, let's just segue into Judge Lewis. Right. Talk about, uh, I know we had quite a fight on the floor, and, uh, and you handled that marvelously. And uh, talk about that process. And then I'd uh, like to hear about your thoughts about the new generation facility proposed in the Odessa area and, and uh, what that might bring and, and or Monahans and, and what it might mean for water in that well, area. I'll, I'll be happy to and I think Keith was kind of remarks. The only problem is that everybody out there is going to say, you mean that's the best legal mind in the house? <laughs> We're in trouble. Everybody's going to be moving out of this state. Uh, I, I am trying to I'm from Odessa and Although energy is not, you know, particularly my area, uh, if you live in Odessa, uh, it's like you live in San Angelo and, and uh, in West Texas, you're going to know things and care a lot about energy matters and about water matters. So thank you very much, uh, Drew, uh, you and Bob, for, for inviting me as well. Uh, I also would like to say, uh, as I'm sure Keith would join me, that the leadership of Jim Keffer, of Chairman Keffer, on that bill and coordinating all of us and everything was just absolutely vital to getting that done and using his credibility to make sure it got through the house and that was that made us that leadership helped make us the leader I think we'd say um, let me let me kind of go through a couple of things um, if I could as far as water use I'm very concerned about it I get calls all the time uh, I get calls almost every day from people concerned about water and water issues and particularly fracking issues um, and um, so let me let me kind of put some of this in perspective if I might for you uh, here the concern is that there's so much drilling from techniques that now use lots of water whether it's horizontal drilling or it's or it's this vertical frack but multiple vertical fracks that use lots of water um, that from in from 2008 to 2011 just three years the amount of water used in fracking in Texas more than doubled in just, in just three years. And from the drilling programs that I'm hearing about, that's going to happen again. There's going to be a lot more because it's, it's extremely successful. So right now, uh, 
absent changes in technology, and we'll get to that in a minute, there are a lot of te technology changes that are being looked at. Um, the, the water use sort of burden from fracking on, on, our, on our supplies is going to be high. Here's what's more alarming than the fact that the water use is more than doubled. The, the brackish water, amount of brackish water use is actually going down at the time the total amount of water is going up. For instance, in 2008, about 70% of the water used was brackish, used in fracking, was brackish. In 2011, the percentage of brackish water use was about 17%. So it's gone from 70% to 17%. And, and the reason is, I think, that the uh, experience of the um, uh, exploration, oil exploration uh, companies has been that, I guess, that fresh water is a lot more effective, it's a lot more efficient in this fracking process. So that's the sort of more the, you know, news that we need to look at. We need to look at those, look at those numbers. We do need to keep it into perspective, as has been, I think, Leonard perhaps mentioned the percentages here of use. Um, in 2011, I think about 82,000 acre feet total of water was used for fracking in Texas. Now, about, there's about 18 million acre feet totally used in Texas. So that looks to me like that's what, 0.5% or something. Now there's other oil field use than just fracking, but, but fracking use is probably about a half of a percent of our total water use. Um, uh, Charles Perry from Lubbock, Representative Perry is, uh, I, I go to him with advice on, on lots of things uh, that uh, he, he really knows about. And one thing he was just mentioning to me uh, before this conference started was, you know, we always have to keep everything in perspective that, you know, if you look at a cotton farm and how much a cotton farm uses on uh, an average week in July, it's, it's a huge amount and it probably dwarfs some of these amounts that might be used, you know, for one fracking process on one rig. But we do have to look at the fact that this is additional water more than we were using before. We have to look at the fact that a lot of this fracking and this water use is in areas that don't have much water to start with. So whereas it may not be a huge percentage of the total state water supply, in a particular area, it could be hugely burdensome because you're looking at that aquifer, maybe a very thin aquifer in a particular place. <coughs> So, so in, in our areas where we're water short, we have to, we have to look at it very closely. Good. Do you want to comment any, any about the uh, generation facility there in Monahans? Uh, the summit? Yeah. Between, between Odessa and, and uh, Monahans, uh, and thank you very much for Drew letting me mention that. There's a, a unique facility going in. I think we'll have some big announcements on it in the next, in the next month, in the next several months. Uh, there's what's called a coal gasification plant, uh, an integrated gasification um, a combined cycle facility is what they call it, IGCC. But basically what happens is it's the Summit Power Plant, and it, um, instead of burning coal, you gasify it. If you put coal or any carbon substance, you put it under high pressure with the right amount of uh, oxygen or air and you pass steam past it, you, it basically falls into its components. So you don't have to burn it, it just combusts. And you get all the components of, uh, of, of the carbon, in other words, for coal. It breaks down in its components. So you get the power, uh, you get the gases captured, um, and uh, so whereas gas plants, are, we always worry about carbon dioxide from gas plants, and we, we should, I mean, that, that is the problem of them is they throw off so much carbon dioxide, it captures all that. And we use that in the oil fields. So the reason it worked why a coal plant would work in West Texas is that it's really not as much a power plant as it is a CO2 production plant. And you take that CO2 and you recover a lot more oil. It is, it is CO2, it's often explained to me, CO2 is like if you have oil on your hands or grease and you run water over them, that's water flood. If you use the best kind of uh, uh, soap that you can use uh, uh, and, and, and you wash your hands underwater, uh, that's like CO2. It's amazing how it displaces oil in a formation. So that's what that plant is for. 
the plant will use a lot of water. But since it's going to be a state-of-the-art plant that's the first in the world, and people all over the world be coming and look at it, we also wanted it to be state-of-the-art as far as water use is concerned. Because these kind of plants, just like every power plant out there, use a lot of water. So we, it's, it's designed to go uh, using uh, desalinized brackish water. And that's the only sources of water we're looking for at that plant is desalinization. And it's going to be, you know, a large customer of a desalinized facility. That facility is not identified. We have several options, but we're looking at that uh, so that we can, it, it's a big customer and it's uh, economically feasible to do it. And that's what we're going to do. Exciting things. Uh, let's uh, try a little different tack. Uh, let's talk about the conflicts between the energy industry and private landowners and possible solutions. So I'm just, I'm, that's a big broad based topic and, uh, and just dig in where you think uh, you see some conflicts and, and possible solutions. So I'll, I'll, I'll toss that question up for the group. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, you know, one, one of the issues that's um, kind of interesting in um, water law and, and the, the groundwater use um, and the fracking is you do get some of that water back. You get flow back, back out of the well. And you do have companies out there looking at recycling that flow back water. It's, I think it's not economic to do, but I believe they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. And, um, you know, folks are working on the technology to recycle that water. But from a legal standpoint, we do get into an interesting issue, which is nobody cared about that flow back water when you took it off the land and you were, you were disposing of it in a saltwater disposal well because it was a waste. But um, under the day case, um, ownership in place and um, SB 332, we know the landowner owns that water. And so you've got the mineral owner out there with his, you know, his contract you know, uh, operator drilling the wells and, and using. The, the mineral owner obviously has the dominant estate and has the primary right to use the surface and to use the water. And he uses the water, fracks the well, it comes back. To recycle that water, in many cases, you might want to take that water off the lease to another lease. Well, you then get in that conflict on who owns that water. So that's an issue that some of us are struggling with for our oil and gas clients. Um, again, it was of, of no value and nobody cared about it when you were disposing of it. But once you're looking at reusing it and perhaps selling it for, you know, it's, it's a nominal amount, maybe maybe 20, maybe 50 cents a barrel. Doesn't sound a lot of like a lot of money when you're comparing that to $100 a barrel for oil. But again, it's a little uh, legal impediment to taking that re recycled water and using it in some other location. Ben, you may have some thoughts on that. Um. Well, I think we are starting. I, I don't have any answers uh, at this point. I think uh, perhaps we're looking forward to a, a lively discussion in the legislature about some of that I anticipate. We're going to have some lively discussions <laughs> in the legislature about a lot of issues. Uh, I think there's a number of issues surrounding that, that general topic and uh, as these uh, tech, one of the flip side to all of this we've talked about natural gas but we've also you know in the Permian three four years ago we were producing about 800 barrels a day uh, 800,000 barrels a day, and now we're producing about a, a million and a half a day. So uh, the Eagleford's really coming on. Where the state's really enjoying a tremendous uh, economic benefit. I keep bringing that up because it's again uh, not necessarily a conflict, but a trade-off, and we've got to be cognizant of uh, of all of the stakeholders that are involved, and and we've got some complex legal issues to to work through that we didn't have two years ago. Keith, I w I would just say it's. It's a conflict, to the extent there is conflict, it's a resolvable conflict. Your leadership here is, is your elected body from this area, Representative Darby, when you said there were 19 representatives from west of the I-35, it feels like there are 100. I mean, they, they are <laughs> as effective as any 19 people could be to represent their interests. And I, last night I had somebody run the, the numbers in Representative Darby's district. There six, roughly 6,500 wells, 3,000 jobs. Oil and gas is 22% of the school tax base. It's um, over 200 million of wages for Representative Darby's district alone. That school tax base number is interesting, and this is where the conflicts, I think, are, 
are resolvable. The, the number for what they are for the taxable base of the groundwater districts is probably much higher than that. And so you have, you have people like um, Mr. Polonis who are incredibly talented at figuring out what infrastructure you need to maximize your ability to, to, harv to, to recharge your groundwater. And, and so while, while the oil and gas industry is a, is a relatively small user of the water, it's a significant, especially in, in areas that are dry, it is a significant amount. Part of the solution is putting the money back in through the groundwater districts to get the resources to build the infrastructure to, to address the water needs. And, and part of it are the solutions we've talked about that, that are going to increasingly decrease the amount of water you're using. And, and again, I, I just have to speak to the wisdom of the legislature. When you have the chairman of natural resources recognize that it's not about mandating what you do to decrease your, your water usage. It's about letting the system work itself out and motivating the industry to decrease their water usage. That's incredibly wise because in other jurisdictions, I guarantee you, they would hear about the gel and they would mandate the use of the gel. That's the worst thing you could do because that might not be the answer. And you've stymied the ability of the industry to go find the answer. The gel might be the answer, but, but so many policymakers and, and other jurisdictions take the wrong approach. Texas has, has the right approach. It's, it's always going to be an evolving approach, but, but the, the, the direction should be quickly going in the right direction to less water usage, although you're going to have more drilling and, and it's going to be hard to be noticeable for a while. Jim. My, uh, I have talked with some people at uh, Halliburton and they have told me that they have come up with a new technique for uh, fracking that saves 30,000 gallons of water, and they have uh, in instituted that particular uh, method. There are other companies out there that uh, are developing recycling methods. And uh, I went to a demonstration in Colorado City where they will skim off the hydrocarbons, they will neutralize that uh, flowback water, and then make it available for uh, refracking and uh, they can do it efficiently and do it in fairly large quantities at a reasonable cost. There are other methods that uh, other companies are, are trying as, as you have heard about the uh, using uh, liquid propane, natural gas. Also uh, there is a sensitivity about the amount of water that uh, is being evaporated from these uh, pits. We have large pits in Crockett County that are 650 feet square, about 10 to 12 feet deep. In this particular part of the country, at, uh, and the data is from the uh, Natural Resources and uh, Conservation Service, in July the evaporation rate is 8.52 inches per square foot of surface water. That's a lot of water. And I uh, talked with uh, Dr. Felder up at uh, Clifford Felder at uh, Texas Tech, and he said yes. When he uh, has his graduate students do a uh, project, they do it on uh, evaporation, and they're totally surprised at how much water is lost in evaporation. There are efforts being made to uh, reduce that amount of evaporation. Uh, from such bizarre things as using ping pong balls on the surface of the water to uh, films. And uh, that work continues. So there's a lot of effort going into trying to conserve water, at the same time use that water efficiently in uh, hydrofracking. And uh, I must applaud the industry at their efforts to do that. And as the uh, other panelists have alluded to, there's a lot of water that uh, is used in uh, in agriculture, that's true. I was talking with the uh, general manager down in uh, Pleasanton at the uh, Evergreen Water District. During the summer is when uh, peanuts grow, and uh, peanut crops take 18 inches of water to uh, develop a crop. That's a lot of water. At the same time, if you look in these areas where this 2% of water is being used, that peak could be great and it's going to affect the local wells. 
and so there's a lot of sensitivity about how much water is being used locally for uh, hydrofracking. There's some initiatives out there that would require the oil and gas industry to apply to the groundwater districts for wells, spacing, et cetera. Uh, give me your views quickly. We're going to save some time for the question, but I'd like uh, your views on that, uh, panelists on on uh, that that uh, disconnect. Some would say between uh, water usage, drilling of wells uh, in the oil and gas industry versus what you try to do, Jim, in the groundwater districts. What we try to do is to uh, reduce the density of wells in a particular area over a section of land and also the spacing of those wells in order to uh, conserve the water. So we try to work with industry in, uh, in those efforts. Well, go ahead, Jim. No, or Leonard, I'm sorry. Leonard. Go ahead. Um, well, let me just say this. Um, I do think that we need reporting of volumes that are being used for fracking and, and as, as Mr. Strama indicated on frack focus, you go to the website, in a split second you can find how much water is being used to frack a well in a particular area of the state. But reporting is important because we need to keep track of the amount of water being used. But what we don't want to have happen is we don't want the location of that oil well to be dictated by the spacing and the other requirements of the local groundwater conservation district. You know, we have 96 groundwater conservation districts in the state, and, and we do want to have an element of local control over water. That's important. That's, that's been fundamental in, in how we've managed groundwater in the state. But at the same time, you really want to be able to optimize the location of that oil and gas well to best uh, drain the oil and gas field, and you don't want the location of your water supply well because of spacing or boundaries or setback obligations to dictate where that, where that well is going to be drilled. So, I do think the Chapter 37, uh, 117 exemption for oil and gas use um, is important. Um, you know, there's a fair amount of debate about the breadth and the scope of that exemption. Um, we practitioners believe it applies not just to mixing drilling mud and, and drilling the well, but we think it also applies to um, use of water for fracking. Now, you know, there's a separate issue, which is, you know, when you complete the well, the Railroad Commission says, well, you're, once you've completed the well, you're done with the oil and gas drilling operations. But that well might produce for two or three or five years, and uh, guess what? You might have a chance to come back and refract that well, um, find new, lo new, new opportunities in that same well bore, and there'll be an open issue as to a debate between Jim and myself over whether or not that, that refracking of that well um, is an exempt use um, under uh, Chapter 36. I would say if you refrack it, you got to you know move a rig onto the well. It might not be a drilling rig; it'll now be a workover rig. But that's a rig on a well, and it's involved in uh, drilling operations, and and so perhaps it ought to be exempt. The uh, the exemption, in some cases, may be possible. However, we are tasked with the establishing our DFC. And we are tasked with establishing our MAG. We also have to have numbers of all uses in order to be able to come up with a fair and balanced DFC and MAG. In addition to that, there may come a time when we reach the limit of that DFC and that MAG, and we cannot have any more uh, overabundance of water extracted from the uh, aquifer. So we're going to come up against a brick wall one of these days. Okay. <laughs> Throw that skunk out at the garden party. <laughs> okay, let's, now's the time for some questions from the audience. Jeffrey, get over here. <laughs> they want to hear you. For the panel, I was wondering what are some of the what are the exemptions from the regulation of the underground water district? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the uh, in Chapter Thirty Six, uh, Part One One Seven, it talks about the exemptions for uh, 
various activities. For example, there's domestic and, and livestock. The exemption there is 25,000 gallons a day or 17 and a half gallons per minute. In uh, other parts of it, uh, if you have less than 10 acres, that particular well on your property, if approved by the uh, board of directors for that district, will be permitted and the amount reported. If it's greater than 10 acres, and we're talking about uh, a commercial well, it is permitted and has to be uh, the amount reported. Right now, for uh, oil and gas, it's exempt for uh, production, and not production, but for drilling and exploration. And what we're saying is that's where it ends. And then for production, fracking, those numbers have to re be reported to the district because we have to know that value for the future DFCs and MAGs. Okay, Kate. And just to be clear, the, the, exempt, the wells which are exempt from the, the groundwater permitting are not exempt from regulation. They are, they are regulated by the Railroad Commission. And, and you know, that gives you, that, that's in order to give people who are making big, many millions of dollars of investment some certainty that that permit's not going to be yanked and, and that they're going to be able to get a return on that major investment. But, you know, that permitting is always evolving as well and and, and and it I don't there shouldn't be a misconception that those wills are unregulated in any way. Okay. Well and let me also mention just in, in the context that the twenty five thousand gallons per day for an exempt domestic and livestock use, that's a well that might be there for generations. It might be there for a long time. If you're fracking a well and you're using five million gallons, that's a lot of water, but still that's a that's not a permanent use. That's a one time use of that water. Thank you. Mayor Lee, let, let, and by the way, when you ask a question, tell us what your name is, and I know this is Mayor Lee. Ex-Mayor Lee. Ex-Mayor Lee, <laughs> right. Ex-Mayor Lee. Heavy on the X, right? Right, okay. right. Well, and I'm on the Up Colorado River Authority and uh, Howard College and several other things, and there's one equation in this whole thing that's got to be addressed. That's educating the public on water use. Water has got to be higher. The boy in San Antonio driving the Lexus, living in the million dollar house, uh, enjoys cheap water. Okay, Mark McLaughlin over there buys $1,200. Mark never bought a 12. He always used a thousand on a range, thousand an acre, you know, no more. But anyway, Mark has ranched those ranches for 30 years and about half paid for them. Okay, he gets an opportunity to sell a million dollars worth of water to an oil company to, to complete a well. Boy, he's 20% he's paid for that $5 million range. He's excited. The city people are going to be paying him about 12% of that price for city water. So, which one of y'all, the guy in San Antonio with USA Insurance was working for $150,000 a month, but he got a job, got an offer of $200,000 to become a division supervisor or something. He didn't turn that down. Now, don't get on the landowners too much for taking that million dollar offer when they've been trying to pay for this land for 30 years. Don't get on the oil companies either. They're furnishing a lot of jobs. They're using the best technology they have at this time. But in any case, water has got to go up to the public and will go up to the public in the future. My, we got a half inch rain here today. I would bet you anything you want to bet, my wife's got to bypass the timers and every sprinkler is running on two acres. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. So, Was there a question in there, Mayor? No. Okay. No, I'm giving you instructions. Okay, okay. <laughs> instructions well placed, okay? Pierce. Here I'm Pierce Miller from uh, Crockett County, Ozona. Jim, I can identify with some of the things you talked about in Judge Lewis. I'm going to point out something. I do have a question at the end of this. Uh, I think the 1% usage of fresh water across the state, 
that's a misnomer because you need to look at what you've identified where the water's been utilized now is a very dry part of the state, limited resource. I heard a lady from the <coughs> Railroad Commission make a comment that we've not talked about today, but once you frack one of these wells, be it one million or five million gallons of fresh water, if it's not recycled, it goes into saltwater disposal well, and it's out of the water cycle permanently. So that's something we haven't addressed. I'd like for somebody to reply to that. John Bain, you or Jim? That is true. It's gone, never to be returned. And uh, that's why it's so important if we get that uh, <coughs> flow back water to recycle it, to reduce that amount of water that is lost to uh, fracking. Um, I had another thought, but it's gone. <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, and, I, and I agree also. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that also, and I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, you know, there's, there's about nine barrels of water produced uh, for every one barrel of oil. So we, we're produ we produce a lot, of oil, a, a lot of water along with oil. Um, and you, so you have flow back water and you have produced water. One thing we have to look at is a lot more efficient use of produced water and reuse of produced water. And at the industry, you know, taking that on as a task. In certain other areas, uh, in other states, they're doing a better job. You know, like in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, they use a lot more produced water for reinjection uh, for fracking purposes than we do, uh, because it's there's an expense in that area. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have the injection wells that we do, the disposal wells that we do, so they manage to clean up and and use a lot more of that produced water. That is one of the techniques, and some others have been mentioned here, uh, some other advances that are being looked at. That's one of the techniques. I do think that it is self-regulating to some extent because all of this water is expensive for these uh, oil companies too when they're doing this exploration. It's expensive to buy. It's ex really expensive to haul out to the sites. So they're looking at ways to cut their water use yes. and, and uh, to, to use more recovered water. And, and I think that's one thing the legislature is going to look at is to what extent does that ought to be in the statute? I'm, to what extent should we let, Jeffrey, I let would, the markets work? I'd invite you to direct your question to them afterwards if, if you had or Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm like, I was just going to give everyone an opportunity. You know, we've touched upon some subjects. Is there anything that you want to tell the folks out here, anything that we, I, we haven't asked or talked about that you I think wanted, these folks need yeah, to know about. I want to touch on something the gentleman just said, that uh, regarding recycling, uh, talk to Leslie Savage. They're coming up with a new set of rules for recycling frack water, and they're going to have a hearing on it at the commission on the 11th of September, which is uh, first or second Tuesday in uh, September. And we'll all be present, right? Okay. Anything else, guys? I'll just, one final comment. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the Railroad Commission has six or seven permitted uh, recyclers now. Two years ago, I don't think they had but one. Um, I live in Midland, and I get a call at least once a week, once every 10 days, from somebody who wants to come pitch their new technology of recycling to my membership in some way or another. And I spend a lot of time weeding through sort of the the carpet bag and fly by night guys and the guys that are really serious. I guess the point is, is there's a real incentive out there and people in the recycling business are realizing that the oil and gas companies are looking at this very seriously and they're willing to spend some money to do it. And I think you're gonna see that trend uh, continue. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel.